Okay, so we'll just we'll just start off, and then uh, if you have any problems, just just let us know. So I'm going to officially welcome everyone to another webinar by Wild Poland, which is the Polish affiliate of the World Institute for Action Learning. And we have an amazing guest with us today, uh, a guest who is a consultant, also an, an academic teacher, and a wonderful person with a great sense of humor that I had the pleasure of meeting. Um, in 2015 at the conference in Washington. And since then, he has been a, a great person to pick his brains about uh, consulting, action learning, design thinking, and all those wonderful things. We have Chuck Appleby with us. Hi, Chuck, how are you? Hi, Tom, it's great to be here. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's great to have you here. So, um, Chuck, thanks, thanks very much for finding time uh, to join us at this webinar. So before we move on to uh, talking about design thinking and action learning and how to combine these things and how to uh, do great work in consulting and also uh, great work in human resource in, in these areas, let me just go through uh, some logistics of the webinar. So if anybody gets disconnected for any reason, here you have a phone number and a PIN number that may come in handy if you want to dial in via phone. So if you get disconnected, uh, you can also listen to the webinar, dialing these, uh, this phone number here and using the PIN. Uh, make sure you use the PIN. It will be necessary to, to uh, log in via, via phone. This uh, information will be on the bottom of every slide since, uh, since now. So if you have any, any trouble, uh, just, just uh, look at that. You will also find these details in the email that you got from the Click Meeting system. Okay, so let's take a look at the, of the, at the plan of our webinar um, and what we want to present you with today is first we will move on, uh, we will go, we will start with, from sort of the overview of action learning and design thinking because I know we have some graduates of the School of Action Learning here with us, so people who are experts in action learning. We also have some people who are experts in design thinking. So just to make sure everybody is on the same page, we'll just go on through uh, the definition of action learning and, and sort of when we use action learning. And also we'll do the same thing with uh, design thinking. And then we will move on to talking about your projects, Chuck, and I will be picking your brains about your uh, knowledge and experience. And then at the end, we'll have a Q&A session. So if you guys have any questions on the way, try to save them, maybe jot them down, jot them down somewhere on the pieces of paper because it's much easier for us to answer questions at the end rather than answering them on the way because uh, every now and again, I will be looking at the chat box, but it's much easier to, uh, to answer all the questions if we get them at the end. Okay, so, so let's just start off and I will um, just talk about what action learning is for those people who are not yet fully familiar with the process. So that could be explained as, a, as, a, as an intense, powerful process for problem solving designed for team groups that basically has two purposes. Purpose number one would be to solve complex issues, urgent, current, uh, important for the organization, team, or maybe an individual. So action is the first purpose of action learning, solving complex problems. And then we have a second purpose of action learning, which is, which is learning which basically boils down to increasing the quality of work. So it's very much applied learning, and we're looking every now and again at how we're working right now to instantly apply some changes in a moment so we can work even more effectively. Now, action learning perhaps can be best explained also in terms of its core, and the core of action learning is the six components. And I know some of you guys have uh, heard me explain six components in numerous times. Some of you have been to my trainings or maybe my presentation. So I would like to head, um, uh, I'd like to give this over to you, Chuck, uh, because I know you are an expert in action learning as well. So can you explain briefly the six components of action learning and in sure. the way you understand them? Yeah. So I think the, the first is that we have um, a challenge or a problem that's of a particular kind. We often make the distinction between a problem and a puzzle. A puzzle has a distinct answer. I can go to an expert or consultant and find an answer. An example might be, how do I build a budget for my organization? Well, there's probably a process and there's probably a CFO 
type person who you could get. A problem around a budget would be, I've built my budget, but I can't get anybody to accept it and use it. So we call this sometimes an adaptive challenge. It's basically, it involves human beings, it involves complex relationships. There is no single solution. Second, we know from group dynamics that a, that a group of four to eight people is, is sort of the optimum size, more than eight, you get people not responding, less than four, you don't get the diversity and the different viewpoints. We very much start from the premise that uh, the most important thing that we do in action learning is ask powerful questions, reflect on them, and then move on to try to understand different answers or ways of working. We have a bias for action. Every meeting of an action learning team ends in a commitment to action by the team or by individuals. We're always focused on both the learning of the individual, sometimes we actually have competencies we're working on, and we're working on how to perform better as a group. How do we, each time we meet, how do we get better at asking powerful questions, at giving tough feedback, at listening deeply to others, and so forth. And finally, there's the presence of an action learning coach whose function is not necessarily to participate in the substance, but to focus on making sure that we're using the process of action learning, that we're learning as we go, that we have a safe environment to work in, and that we're taking actions as uh, and making commitments. I think if I had to say, say, what's the number one thing that a coach focuses on? I would use the word clarity. Gaining clarity about what the issue is. Gaining clarity around what steps are we gonna take to solve the issue. Gaining clarity about the realism uh, of the actions that we're going to take. Okay, thanks very much, Chuck. And since we're talking about action learning, would you um, would you like to say a few words about how action learning um, impacted your your business, how it influenced your business? Because I know you began consulting some time ago before you knew action learning, and then you, you came across it and you learned action learning and started using it in your consulting yeah. business. Can you say a few words how it changed your, your business? Yeah. So about 20 years ago, I was in a, a consulting company. I was the head of management consulting, uh, and I decided to go on my own. And almost, within a year, I actually met Mike Marquardt, who was uh, one of the people that helped, along with Mike, I, I co-founded WILE, World Institute for Action Learning. But Mike taught me the basics of action learning, and immediately I grasped that this was something that was gonna have great impact on helping to problem solve. But what was the amazing thing in terms of business was suddenly my business started taking off. I started seeing people saying, we need help solving problems. Some people asked specifically, we need, we need to use action learning to solve our problems. So within about a year of the training I got, I was helping companies like Microsoft, John Hancock Financial in Boston. I was helping large government agencies like the Department of Energy in the United States. So because the power of action learning is so easy to, to understand and use, I think it was very attractive for organizations and companies to use it. Uh, I use it to this day. I find that I can't deliver training anymore unless I'm kind of using an action learning approach, i.e. experiential, working on real problems that the organization is having. So it, it made a huge difference in my business. It made a huge difference in my life in terms of giving me the confidence to be able to walk into an organization with a simple method that people could use, understand, and get else with. The biggest early success I had was working with Microsoft in Nairobi with the UN Environmental Program. It was a leadership development group. We had a team of six people in, the, in my group, and the question was, how do I build an energy neutral building in the Nairobi campus of the UN? We, I have no money, said the problem owner. I have no buy-in, said the problem owner. And I've got 10 other things to do. In three days, the group was able to help this project engineer realized that she wasn't alone, that that was the kind of world that they lived in. And a year later, that building was built on the compound with money 
within the schedule and became a showcase for the entire UN, uh, UN world to say, how can we make our buildings energy neutral? I had a huge success right off the bat, which really buoyed my confidence. Thanks very much, Chuck. That sounds very inspiring. I'm very curious about your approach to design thinking. So let's just move on. And now that we have explained the basics of action learning, let's try to say a few words about design thinking. You can also change the slides if you want. It's just enough to click on the next slide on the on the right side of the of the um, of the screen. Um, yeah. Can you see it? Can you see the slides? Yeah. So just go ahead and say a few words about what your approach to design thinking is. How you, how you would define it? Yeah. So. Um, Whoops, I think I went <laughs> too far. Yeah, that's too far. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, design thinking. Why did I come across it? I actually came across it, you know, just in general uh, familiarity with the world of OD. But what got me into it was my son. He went to Stanford to the design school, the D school, very similar and funded by Hasso Plotner, who created the school in Potsdam. Uh, and what I noticed was design thinking and action learning were very, very similar in the underlying precepts or principles that guided them. And basically, design thinking is a way to help, first and foremost, to gain a deep understanding of people's needs. And those needs are often unspoken, uh, not just unmet needs, but design thinking teaches you how to ask questions to, to get what's underneath a person's need. And let me give you an example. Henry Ford, who built the, you know, the first major assembly line in the US in Detroit, said if I'd asked people what they wanted, they'd have told me a, a faster horse. And so what he, what he began to realize is that I have to really understand what's underlying their need for transportation. Well, it, it also it had a, it had a, they had a need to get employment. So he was able to respond to that. They had a need to get fresh air. The car helped people get out of the the cold, smoky city of Detroit. So he began to understand if I can attack a broader challenge and get to people's sort of unspoken needs, I can be more successful in gaining stakeholder buy-in and gaining success. The, the action learning method itself is um, is five steps. I think yeah, is that the yeah the, the, and the first step, as I said, is gaining empathy. Empathy, that ability to put yourself in other people's shoes and to sort of look at the world with three questions in mind. What are they thinking? What are they feeling? And what do they really need? And many times, as I said, those needs aren't even stated. The method itself, um, I used the very first time I integrated action learning and design thinking was a project with the Arlington County, a county that I live near, in, near Washington, D.C. And we used design thinking as part of this project to do just what we talked about, to help gain empathy with users. But what are the five steps? The five steps of action learning are first, gain empathy, go out and talk to people, understand their deeper needs. We define specific users, that second step. We design a point of view, for example, a point of view uh, in the case of this library project, was a teenager who never comes to the library. The library wanted to figure out how to get teenagers, 30-somethings, millennials, and new immigrants into the library system. They weren't there, so that was our challenge. So we went out and interviewed teenagers, and we found out that the teenagers' point of view was, if I'm going to go to the, if I'm going to have fun in my life, I need to have food. So when we asked them what they did, they said, we love to eat right after school. The library didn't have any food. So when we came up with ideations, the ideas, people said, well, how can we get food in the library? Well, what if we, what, what if we park food trucks in the parking lot? So that would attract teenagers, and then they'd sort of mosey into the library or walk into the library. But that turned out not to be possible because of regulations and laws. So they ultimately said, what if we created a separate room where teenagers could meet, could eat, could talk to each other a bit, uh, and get them into the library? And that's exactly what they tried, and they were amazed. Teenagers showed up, and they're now teenagers in the library, in, this, in the Central Library of Arlington County. And they built a, 
they built ideas. You can see they built an idea. How will we do this? And they tested it and they built it and they tested it. So there's a process of trying new ideas and testing them. Underlying design thinking is this notion of, I've got to focus on the human need, not the company's need, the organization needs, but the human needs. I've got to, I've got to have diverse people. That's one of the principles of action learning. We get four, five, or six diverse people. And I'm sure if you've been to Thomas's course, he talks about the, the story of the pizza man who was invited in to deliver pizza and the frustrated group said, we don't know what to do. We might as well ask the pizza man. And the pizza man said, why does A go to B? Just playing with them, they couldn't answer. Turned out they saved $30 million from that diverse point of view. We, we have a bias for action in action learning. The only way we learn is to take action and reflect on that learning. We, we try when we, in design thinking not to give somebody a 30 page briefing, but to give them just a taste of what we're trying to do and get their responses. Um, we look at experimenting, we try different things. We stick to a very simple process. And hopefully you can see that the parallels with the six elements, focus with, with the action learning, the focus on action, the focus on diversity, the focus on gaining clarity of the user's point of view in design thinking matches our, our second step in the design action learning process, which is to get clarity on the problem. So from there, I guess mm -hmm. we can go just a little more into the story. Um, here was part of that library project. We noticed that, as I said, that teenagers weren't coming into the library. We also noticed that Metro renters that these millennials who lived along the metro line in Arlington County weren't showing up to the library. So they had, the, they had some ideas. What if we had a, a fun game night at the library once a month that was optimized to attract millennials? And that's what they did. They, they had another idea of having an annual ball to raise money for literacy programs where people, millennials, young people got to dress up, have some fun, and donate some money. So, the combination of action learning and design thinking works because the mindsets underlying them are very similar. It works because the design thinking piece emphasizes sort of more of the creative tools you need to gain new ideas, maybe out of the box ideas. But when I do an action learning project, or a design thinking project, I integrate the two. I start with action learning Framing the design challenge. And what I find, as you may have found if you've done action learning, is that the challenge that people bring to the table often change after 20, 30, 40 minutes of questioning. The problem might shift from, let me give you a real example. One agency I worked in said, how do we get uh, more women and minorities into gateway positions to become a senior leader. A gateway position was a, a position of being an executive assistant to the leadership team, a job that required 24-7 <laughs> participation. And many of the people, especially women or parents raising children, didn't want a 24-7 job. So we shifted the challenge to how do I get more women and minorities in the leadership period, peer, positions, period? We dumped the idea of a gateway position, a step you had to take to get there. So again, the, the combination of being able to really deeply frame a challenge and then have a, a set of tools, including action learning, to come up with people's deeper needs and new ideas to help meet those needs makes for a really useful and powerful combination. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much, Chuck. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's very inspiring. Um, so, so you just said that we're gonna we're gonna stop here for the moment. And um, so you just say so you just said that you start the project if you want to combine action learning with design thinking, you start using action learning to frame the problem, right? Right. And I continue to and use action learning as a meta framework for. For, for for the rest of pro the project by emphasizing the need to ask powerful questions, to be clear on our next step, to always take action, to always make sure we have a diverse group of people involved in 
framing and solving the problem. So, so if I understand correctly, throughout the whole project, both approaches can be combined. It's not that you use action learning only at the beginning uh, right. when you frame the problem and then you stop and you just carry on normal, uh, I mean, non-action learning design thinking uh, uh, actions, but you can start with action learning, frame the problem, then carry on using design thinking and still during team meetings use action learning process to ensure diversity of ideas and uh, creative thinking and also being focused on on what the challenge is without any digressions and, and, and side right. topics. Would that be accurate? Absolutely. And so the key things that continue in action learning are that constant desire to be clear on what we're doing and why we're doing it. The use of powerful questions instead of making statements only to get different perspectives. Um, and, and stopping periodically to reflect on how we're doing. That's a key piece of action learning. We're learning by taking action. In many problem solving methods, we simply you know, go straight on through. We never stop and say, is this working? Is this process working? How do we improve it? Is everybody involved? Is everybody feeling heard? And, and that's uh, such an important piece of action learning. The constant reflection throughout the process and learning from the taking of action. What did we just learn after we went to the interview process, through the interview process? What did we learn, not just about the substance of the problem, but what did we learn about interviewing? What did we learn about our, our own ability to really draw people's deeper needs out? So people, we emphasize the need to grow as a person, to grow your ability to problem solve, and obviously to give the organization an outcome at the end that was desirable. Now, Chuck, I have one question, uh, one more question regarding combining both processes. Um, one of the most characteristic things about the while model of action learning is the first ground rule that we haven't mentioned yet. And some of our viewers are surely familiar with the first ground rule, but just to make sure everybody realizes what it is, is that during the meeting, all statements may be made only in response to questions. And questions can be asked of anyone, by anyone, at any time. So all digressions, all side topics, long monologues, uh, unwanted critique or judgment are eliminated because we only use questions and we only use answers to post questions. Um, what do you think that adds to design thinking meetings? Well, absolutely. I mean, well, let's take the example of when we're brainstorming an idea. So, and design thinking has a number of tools that it uses. Um, it, it has a tool, uh, for example, that, that asks us, what if we wanted to destroy this idea? How would we do that? So you're actually brainstorming the reverse of what you're trying to do. But what we do to supercharge that from an action learning standpoint is ask everybody as they brainstorm to put things into a question. So we say things like, what if we did this? How might it be if we did that? The heart of design thinking is empathy. The way to gain empathy is through curiosity. The way to curiosity is by framing things as much as possible in a question. So brainstorming turns into a, not just saying, let's try A, B, C, and D. We actually say, what if we tried A? What if we tried B? And that opens people's mind and, and allows them to be more open and be even more curious. We're trying through the power of questions to help people be more curious and look for different points of view. Now, do you think using action learning with design thinking requires a lot more preparation or a lot more effort from the side of the facilitator or the consultant? Well, certainly, just like in action learning, you learn a set of tools and processes. But what, what design thinking and action learning share is that the tools and processes are really not that difficult. I mean, and one of the great joys that I've had in design thinking is that there's so much out there. If you want to get involved in design thinking, you can go to the Stanford 
D school site, you can go to, I mean, you just, the tools are basically given away. The tools are very often summarized like the Stanford, they have something called boot camp bootleg, a design thinking boot camp, and this is the bootleg or the, the goodies that you get. They have 88 tools that they give you for free. They're all just, they're all described on one or two pages. So the simplicity of design thinking, of the process of the tools, the simplicity of action learning, the process and the tools um, really are, are so powerful. We want to make people feel like they can do it, to have what we call creative confidence, not to feel like I need to have a consultant at my side for every step of the way because I really don't know how to do this. So both, both methods are really naturally empowering to the people that are doing it. Yeah, I'm gonna check. I'm gonna repeat my question. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if I have expressed myself clearly. So I just want to make sure um, you understand what I'm trying to to um, to say. Imagine you are an act, uh, a design thinking facilitator, and you're thinking, well, maybe I'm gonna use action learning along my design thinking process. So my question to you would be, does an action does a design thinking facilitator need to do a lot more with the group, with the team, a lot more if he wants to use action learning as far as the preparation is concerned, as far as the whole, yeah, I guess of the preparation process. Yeah. Would the pre preparation so, process be a lot more effort for a design thinking consultant if he wanted to use an action learning process? So I, I think the bottom line answer is, is not a lot. So let me just give you my perspective. 80% of the, the success of an action learning project, design thinking project, problem solving in general, happens before you have the first meeting. I mean, that's an important learning that I've had, that you really have to understand what the client's need is. You have to understand what tools you're going to do. You're going to understand how do I get a group of people that are going to work together. That, um, And so you're always going to do a lot of planning um, but it's really kind of getting in sync with the sponsor, the customer of the project. And so taking a lot of time to think about how to do it is you're going to be taking time to plan anyway. To integrate action learning and design thinking is not going to take that much more time. If okay. you're doing if, uh, if you're following my rule of 80-20, 80% of the real powerful effort has to be done before the project even starts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, you have spoken a lot about your approach to design thinking and you have emphasized empathy a lot. Now, what would be your, or the core, the heart of your approach to action learning? So I think the, the heart of it, to me, what stood out when I think about what action learning, what, what's unique, what's powerful, it's the emphasis on clarity. Um, this is what I've taken away from action learning is that we don't move forward in problem solving and action learning until we have some general consensus among the team about what the real problem is. Design thinking will say you need to understand the problem. But what I find action learning brings is that oftentimes design thinking projects start from a given. The, the senior leader says, how do I get more people into to become executive assistants in order to prepare them to be leadership coaches? I mean, to become leaders. Action learning would say, we've got to define the real challenge before we go off and start brainstorming ways to get people into that gateway position. So action learning brings to the table the real need that I don't see in design thinking to frame the macro problem, to understand are we really addressing even the right issue before we walk down the road. Okay. Did I answer your um, question? Chuck. The last thing I want to do is be a politician and just give a pat answer to every question regardless of what it was, right? No, no, that's fine, that's fine. I just want to make sure if you can hear me clearly right now because yes. uh, I'm just looking at my computer. Excellent. So, Chuck, um, if you were to 
uh, name some key factors that are required to combine both processes, what would they be? What would you need to take care of if you want to use action learning while doing design thinking? Yeah. So I, I think it's I think it's really to be clear, as we suggested earlier, that uh, I need to integrate both. That I that I can't use action learning just at the front end. I have to really be conscious of using action learning as a process throughout the whole problem solving method to to bring the people's mind that before we start every meeting, one of the things we do in action learning is say, what's the problem for today? Which might be develop a survey to gain data. But instead of saying, hey, we're developing a survey, an action learning approach would be to say, so, so is the survey really what we need? How, do, how are we going to, uh, to build our survey? Why are we building the survey? A good action learning team is going at every meeting to be clear on what we're doing today. At the micro level, at the meeting level, just like in the macro level, action learning says at the front end, we get very clear on what the problem is we're solving for the entire project. So continuity of action learning th throughout the problem solving and being able to use it as a guide for every meeting is key and it can be nicely placed as a an, an overarching or a meta framework problem solving method including action learning, including action learning they're both action learning and design thinking are classified as problem solving methods i think they both have unique values i think that you have to carefully think up front how am i going to make sure that I'm true to the principles of both of these methods as I go through. And what makes that easy, easier than one might expect, is that the mindsets underlying design thinking, and the mindsets underlying action learning, for example, the importance of clarity, the power of questions, the importance of diverse viewpoints, those underlie both of those methods. So they naturally, you don't have to struggle because you've got different ways of thinking with those two methods. They naturally complement each other. Are you still there, Tom? Hello, Tom. Are you back? Yeah, I'm here. Sorry, I had to. I had to gain again for some reason. Um, okay, so uh, so I'm back, and I have another question. Um, uh, hold on one second. Uh, I got distracted because I had to log in again. Uh, okay, tell us. Uh, tell us. Tell us about some challenges while using action learning and design thinking. Yeah, I, th I think um, the, the first challenge that comes to mind is the challenge of people wanting to go fast to the answer. So in the action learning context, people say, okay, I know what the problem is. Just let me start solving it, brainstorming, et cetera. I find that phenomenon common in just action learning groups. I find that phenomenon in design thinking groups. Many times people say, I don't need to go out and collect a lot of data from users, I, I kind of know what I, I know what's inside their heads. So to really overcome the, the exp, I'm gonna call it the expert mindset that I have the answer, I know the answer. How do you in many overcome cases, it? Remember Reg Revens at the Cavendish Physics Lab at Cambridge, one of the fathers of action learning, said we have got to get away from relying only on experts, academics, consultants, etc. We need to be able to have a method through powerful questions of, of creating our own knowledge. Design thinking shares that same basic notion. 
I cannot and should not just go to an expert and say, how do I solve this problem? I need to first understand the problem. I, I need to go deeper in what somebody's needs are because it may not be what the expert sees. The expert may not see because they're focused on using their method to solve the problem. The, C, the C, Apple's chief technology officer said in an interview, the biggest challenges I have using an innovation in Apple are experts and the fact that people are too nice to each other. They don't give good feedback you know, for ideas. He said the experts basically dismiss any new inquiry. They want to go right to what they've known and done all their lives. And what we're finding in this, this volatile, ambiguous, uncertain world we live in is that the world is changing so fast that we really do have to have a way of developing new knowledge and first and foremost, developing an understanding and empathy with users who are now in a new environment. That's so what check. putting together a team you know, who uses questions and reflection does. Mm -hmm. So as a consultant, how do you overcome that expert thinking in organizations? Well, I think we, we, that's one of the things you do in preparing when you create the team. First of all, you make sure that the team isn't just a bunch of experts. And that is the way that most people will go solve a problem. I have an HR problem. I am going to get five HR experts in the room to solve this problem. That, that's exactly opposite to what Reg Revens at Cavendish said. He, in fact, brought a biologist and a chemist, Watson and Crick, the designers, you know, the people who made the whole notion of DNA um, known throughout the world. He brought them in to ask questions from a chemist and a, and a biologist's point of view to the physicists because they had their own way of thinking and looking. And one of the powerful impacts was because of that new different perspective, the lab turned out more Nobel Prizes in the next decade than they'd ever gotten in, in the history of the Cavendish Physics Lab. So getting people to overcome the fact that I have to convene a group of experts is the first thing. The next thing to do is to lay it on the table that how do we make sure that we remain open? That we, and we talk about you know, the concept of the beginner's mind. How do we make sure that we come into this project with an open mind? The third thing you do is to put on the table to ask people, what assumptions are you making about this project before we get started? So we try to start understanding people's biases, assumptions, limiting mindsets that might be at play. I'm going to stop there. Okay. Okay. And how is your how is your using uh, the combination of action learning and design thinking evolving now? How has it evolved? Evolved, sorry, over the past. Yeah. So much like I started out using the World Institute for Action Learning as a core method, which is still a core method to me, I did start bringing other tools in to help. For example, I have a framing framework that I'm glad to share with people. It's a simple. It's a simple picture of desired future, current reality, uh, external factors, the gap in between where we are and where we want to be, and the underlying assumptions and mindsets. And I and I get people to basically cue storm or brainstorm questions around that framework to help them get started in framing. So, in design thinking, I've done the same thing. I've reached out beyond design thinking into variants uh, that are related to design thinking. For example, Lean Startup. If you Google Lean Startup, you're gonna come across a guy named Stephen Blank, who has enormously powerful insights about, about how, to, how to be more innovative. Another notion is a, is a body of knowledge called Jobs to be Done. That's a whole nother body of knowledge related to design thinking, but it has some viewpoints, some tools that I've brought in and added. So I, I guess what I'm saying is you have to be a continuous learner. You have to be willing to adapt your knowledge and constantly grow it and be looking for new and better ways and spe especially simpler ways. And I think that's a big message. I'm always looking for simpler ways to help 
people understand problems. I love to have pictures and frameworks that are simple uh, so that people don't feel overwhelmed. Like they, they can look at a picture, my, my framing framework, and say, I get it. I see what you're trying to do. Now let me go and develop questions in each one of those blocks, <laughs> reality, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember when we talked about our webinar a uh, couple days ago, you mentioned the pharmaceutical marketing project in Massachusetts. I'm not sure if, if you've talked about uh, during the webinar. I don't think you have mentioned oh. it. Would you like That's to say okay. a few words about it? Yeah, I mean, that, that relates to your question about challenges. So I'm helping a pharmaceutical in Massachusetts. I'm helping the marketing group. Uh, you all know that the healthcare industry in the U.S. and throughout the world for that matter, but we're in chaos here. I mean, co companies are merging. Uh, methods of delivering healthcare are changing. Hospitals are combining with insurance company. The head of Amazon, Jeff Bezos, is starting to say, I'm going to develop my own healthcare system for my world. Um, and so they really realize that we need to approach marketing in a different way if we're going to really adapt to the future in this changing market. But here's the challenge that I found in working with them. So most of these people are salespeople. So what is a sales mindset? A sales mindset is I have a target. It's basically in this quarter, I'm going to get such and such you know, a new business, right? And so their mindset is very much short term. They tend not to work in teams. They work alone or maybe with a partner. And so we come together and we're, in a, we're, at, we're at the one year point in a month on this project. And one of the people actually said, Chuck, you're hurting our DNA. You're making us work in ways that we're just not used to. We're not used to long projects. We're not used to collaborating with a group of people. We're used to sort of not clarifying what the challenge is. We're used to, I have the target, it's go sell more to that company. And we, without launching, without sitting back and saying, is that company really the most ideal company to sell to right now? So we're really running into sort of these major cultural um, barriers that are different, I mean, just different ways of doing business than the mindset of an action learning uh, session or a design thinking session. They don't like the idea of gaining clarity, taking time. They don't work with a group. They don't think about, uh, is this the right problem? So, the so, so that is, yeah. yeah, so that is an ongoing process right now, correct? Yes, yeah, still. And I'm at the point where I have to decide, do I keep pushing them harder and harder? Or do I back off and say they're tired? Maybe we just need to relook at what we're doing and are we trying to bite off too much? And how long have they been working together? Almost a year now. Four teams working. One team, I will tell you, one out of the four teams basically said, Chuck, we don't want your help. This was the team that says you're hurting our DNA. They just said, we don't want a consultant. We just want to do this our way. <laughs> and and um, so I'm really anxious, you know, to see how the different teams perform. But I think the leadership realizes that the team lead who doesn't want any help is really not going to help build a culture where people actually do come to collaborate, where they're comfortable with some uncertainty and ambiguity. Um, and so that's going to be a reflection that, that we've been doing along the way with the steering committee. As this is so you mentioned, you mentioned that you had a dilemma whether to push them harder or maybe, uh, you know, give them a slack and say, okay, maybe they're tired or something. So what are you going to do? So I think, I think the answer is there are four teams. Well, and in this case, three teams that my, my folks are helping them with. I think we're going to look at what makes sense for each of those teams. I think some are, are ready to, to, cry, to say, you know, we need to stop and find a fresh blood. I think other teams might be, hey, we're, we just need some perhaps new thinking and some different expertise to help us go on. So I think it's going to be a case by case basis. Mm -hmm. But the big challenge is starting up something that I think that leader needs to do, and that is how in parallel with all of this do I start working on hiring people who have a bit of a different mindset? 
about setting goals and objectives and the accompanying incentives so that people aren't just working by themselves and aren't working just on short-term goals. Chuck, uh, we're, so we're slowly, <laughs> right, we're slowly coming to an end of this part of the webinar before we give some room to our audience so that they can ask some questions. Uh, so the title of the webinar is how to combine action learning and design thinking. So if you were to answer this question in one sentence or two sentences to sum up the whole thing, what would you say? How should we combine or how can we combine this, I think, in action learning? So I would say the first step is to just say, uh, is to, to acknowledge the fact that the, the, the chief power that action learning adds to design thinking is the ability to say, what's the real problem we're working on here? So I would say, if you're already doing design thinking and you want to use action learning, start by, by just helping people to step back before they start on, a, you know, on an agile project or start building scrum teams to move forward, to really use an action learning approach to frame the challenge. I would say if you're already using action learning and you want to combine it with design thinking, I'd say, Basically, just take a look at how design thinking is done. Uh, look, look at the Stanford method. If you, uh, as one, look at the Hasso Plattner School in Potsdam and say, oh, here's how I can overlay the principles and tools of action learning over what they're already doing. And it's a Thanks simple so thing, it's a powerful thing. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much, Chuck. Just a few words uh, to those of you who wants to uh, learn, who want to learn action learning. In September, we will have a course of action learning that's called the Poland School of Action Learning, and it's got, that's going to happen in five days in total, two plus three, as you can see on the slide. And what's going to happen in those five days are basically three things. Number one, you get a lot of practice. You have some short knowledge parts devoted to knowledge about problem solving and, and action learning. But the majority of working in the training is that is, is uh, taking part in action learning sessions and leading the session as an action learning coach. Number two, you get tools that you can use after the training to conduct action learning projects. There are tools that allow you to almost, from beginning to an end, lead an action learning sessions and also tools that show how to implement a longer project and also you get an experience. A lot of people that graduate from action learning uh, courses say that's a strong personal experience because you get to train your problem solving, communication, teamwork skills, and also your leadership skills. So be prepared if you want to take part to get a lot of feedback and also to give a lot of feedback to other people because we start from a standpoint that you have to experience and have a strong personal experience of this process to later on be able to. All right, guys, so we're going to end the webinar right here. If you want to contact myself, uh, here are the contact details. If you want to contact Jack Abbey, you can just Google him and his company called Appleby and Associates. Am I right, Chuck? Yep. So go ahead and, and, and check out Appleby and Associates. If you, have, if you have any trouble contacting Chuck, uh, just just email me or call me, and I'll make sure that you can you can get in touch with Chuck, with Chuck as well. Thanks very much for being with us here today. Thanks very much for attending this webinar. Uh, keep in touch. I will be informing you about the next webinars. Take care and enjoy the wonderful weather that we have right now. Thanks so much and have a Thank good you. day. Bye bye. Thanks, Chuck. Thanks, bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks.